And we're live. Uh, welcome once again. This is uh, the Underwater Tribe podcast with Luca Vime and Mike Veach. We're here in Bali this week with our special guest star, Serge. Please, I am, I am, I am Canadian, so I cannot, uh, you know, pronounce your name properly. How do you, how do you pronounce it properly for us? My name is pronounced Abu Jaili, which is a Lebanese name. However, I'm German, and I'm quite happy to be here today. Yeah. Excellent. Hey, sir. Thank you for coming, Abu Jaili. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That sounds pretty Serge good. Serge is a, a quite famous underwater photographer, especially in, in Germany, but uh, not just in Germany, all, all over the place. He runs the Samambai Liverboard. Uh, he was, for many years, based in Lembe. And now uh, now he gets to travel around Indonesia. We've just caught you on your way back from uh, Deep. Or not, sorry, not Deep. We've just caught you on the way back Boot. from Boot. Boot. Or Boot. Or oh, Boot. The Boot Show. Das Boot. Das Boot. Das Boot. Or the Boot. Boot. Actually. The boat there. The boat. <laughs> and he's popped into our studio for a little chat on, uh, well, underwater photography, diving, Indonesia diving, all that kind of stuff. Over to you, Serge. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes. Um, well, I, I'm in Indonesia now since nine years. And I did uh, the western part of Indonesia. I stayed in Banda Aceh. I did the very eastern part. I was in North Sulawesi, as you said, for about seven years, uh, diving Lembe Strait, a little bit of Bunaken as well. And I'm now on a liverboard, doing a little bit more of a mixed up stuff. So not only macro like I used to do in Lembe, a little bit more of everything. Like my old memories from Maldives. And uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. All right. So tell us uh, a little bit like um, about this transition, you know, like from being land based uh, in a resort and all of the sudden uh, go to a uh, liverboard. Well, not all of the sudden it took how many years? Six years? How, lo how long you, have you been in the Lambeth Strait? For a long time. Seven years. Seven years in the Lambeth Strait. Uh, OK. And after seven years, you decide to take off and go with the wind on a liverboard and travel all around Indonesia. So tell us about the differences between being land-based and being on a liveaboard. Beside the obvious part of that, you're going to see more things. <laughs> and <laughs> you're, you were going there. And, and your bedroom moves a lot more. Yeah. So okay, so I don't think I see more things, but I see a bigger variety of things and more especially a bigger variety of places. That's right. a big advantage. Right. And the disadvantage of all my friends, you guys, for example, my all my friends yeah, told me, oh, liverboard, it's different, it's that, and it's, uh, ooh, everything breaks all the time, and um, it's not that in a resort nothing breaks. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, first of all, we I know. picked a pretty new boat, so um, that's quite good. Um, we have a very good crew, so the disaster rate I'm, I'm having to deal with right now is very small. It's very small. That's very and, good. And um, the difference is not that much. All right. Yeah. So, what I appreciate a lot on the boat is the difference in between the whole check-in, check-out happenings. Like on the boat, I like a lot that everybody comes on the first day, you have a big drama. Oh, I forgot this. Oh, I need that. Oh, can you fix this? Oh, I forgot my lens this. I forgot my that. Oh, I need a regulator. And then you have one and a half days of a quite intensive stress. And then you have everybody relaxing, just going diving. Getting and then at the end, you have two days about, oh, I need to change my flight or this. Oh, I need yeah, to pack this. Oh, have you seen my snorkel? Snorkel. And then, um, <laughs> why did I you like bring a, a snorkel? <laughs> Whereas in the resort, you have that constant, maybe not as yeah, concentrated, yeah, but more constant. Every, every day, somebody's checking yeah, in. Yeah, somebody's coming in and coming out. out. Exactly. Every evening, somebody has its last evening. Oh, come on, let's have a beer. It's the last evening. I like actually that rhythm on the boat a lot. That's true, you know, Plus like the a, combination of I, the sea. I, I never thought process. about that, but you are completely right. Like the average, it takes normally one or two days uh, for the guests to get used, you know, like get rid of, of their jet lag and getting into the dive holiday mode, you know, like uh, ho or holiday in general. And then it goes really like all into like a chill out and more cruise and enjoying time. Yeah. And I never thought it uh, like that way, but you are, you really hit the point uh, when you said the difference between uh, land base and, uh, and, and liveaboard. I was expecting more like, uh, I don't know, what about the sea gypsy life? You know, like the fact that you're changing uh, dive destinations uh, and here in Indonesia, even though like we see similar things under the water a bit every, not everywhere similar, but uh, the scenery changes a lot. Like if you are in Rajampat, if you are in Komodo, outside it changes. So 
Yeah, yeah, a lot. That's true. I that's mean, it's it's not only the species underwater you see; it's the whole type of the reef is different. It, feel, uh, it feels like you're gonna go to a new place after a few months, right? Yes, yes, very true. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the top side that looks different. I mean, if you look just at the islands from from Raja Ampat, those limestone, beautiful, yeah, very beautiful, the but Komodo also, Raja. but it's just different. Exactly. And underwater is the same. It's it's maybe the same species you have, but it's a different. Yeah. Distribution. Here you have more that, here you have more that. Maybe in Raja Ampat you have a little bit more of everything, but that doesn't mean that Komodo doesn't have nice coral formation. It's also very exactly. beautiful and you have like Yeah, yeah. that's something we get to be asked uh, we get asked a lot is like uh, what do you like more? Do you like more Komodo or do you like more Raja Ampat? What do you normally answer about that, Mike? I say they're different. I mean Raja for, for the big stuff and for the for the color and schools of fish, I prefer Raja. But Komodo's just got more variety. It's got the little stuff, as which Roger has some little stuff, but nothing compared to Komodo in the way of critters. Yeah, it's very, very hard question to to answer. To like, what do you tell normally to the people between when they want to know about the difference between Komodo and Raja? Serge. <laughs> I mean, I'm working in this industry since a while, so when people ask me where should I go, and I tell them, you have to go everywhere. Correct. That's what <laughs> so I end up you, saying at the end, too. Um, it's very different, and I would say if I have been diving in Raja Ampat for several months, I'm looking forward to go to another place and vice versa. But if you come for the first time to Indonesia and you want to come on a liverboard, which I think is a good choice, because as we mentioned before, that whole rhythm, yeah. I think that translates also to the guests. So I think it's the way to go. Uh, I think um, if you come for the first time, you should do Raja Ampat or Komodo because yes. this is where you get the manta rays and everybody likes manta rays. Um, so. But the other trips are nice as well. I like the Banda Sea crossings. I appreciate Alor a lot because it's not so busy and mm -hmm. it's very versatile. Yeah, later but, we um, will talk a little bit more into that. But I think Raja Ampat or Komodo would be the first choice. And yeah. then it just comes down to how much time you have it to do it because and Komodo is a little year? bit easier to travel to. Yep. Um, exactly. And so Raja that's Ampad is a little bit bigger. I actually say that uh, quite a bit. You know, normally, if my advice would be like start with Komodo, because uh, Komodo it's easier to access to. You it's can just do a one-week like, trip. Exactly, it's a short flight. It's a smaller area, yeah. so like Much there is also less traveling on the liverboard. There are many, uh, many of uh, our guests or some of our guests that are actually, they've never been on a liverboard before. And actually the Komodo trip is a great uh, chance uh, to start uh, your liverboard experience because you don't have that much traveling time between a location to the other one. Within three hours, you're always uh, pretty much everywhere, unless you're really crossing all the way from Bali to Komodo. But if you're already in the Komodo area, the maximum boat ride will be around uh, three hours. Yeah, top. ought to out to Sangang yeah. or something like that. So that's a good way to start to get used to. Generally, it's calm water. You always find a place where to shelter to. So I, that's why I suggest about Komodo. And this is something that I really like about Komodo too, is that uh, I can start my morning having like a great world-class uh, uh, manta dive uh, and then just move uh, one hour from the site and have a world-class uh, macro dive, you know. So, Serge, speaking Sorry. speaking about the different liverboards and all that stuff, tell us a little bit about your liverboard. Oh, not your, but the one that you work on, and uh, where is it at at the moment? Um, it's right now in Raja Ampat, not in Komodo, sorry. And um, it's called the Samambaya. Plug it. Give us, give us the website. Uh, it's... Uh, you've just seen it, yeah. And Samambaya is a, a, a leaf... Uh, a plant that grows in Brazil, uh, where the owner has worked for a long time, and uh, so it's not an Indonesian name. Aha! Uh -huh. uh, All right, it's not, that's it's not the, the origin of the word name. For, uh, princess yeah. of the sea yeah. or something but it like sounds that. Like it's just, something it just sounds cool. Very plausible and, uh, Indonesian name, though. Like uh, some bias sounds like not it could only be. Only sounds cool. It is also a very cool boat, and it's a pinisi. It's a wooden sailing boat, the traditional Indonesian way uh, of South Sulawesi to build those boats. They were originally cargo boats, but uh, there is now a great variety of um, options to do that and I would say we're a more upscale one we don't say luxury that the, the owner doesn't like the word right. but uh, we're it's a quite what, nice what's the you're, size? You're, you're more you're more than you're not a budget you're, you're we're not a budget option yes. no. right. mid to higher range 
Okay, the, well, let's let's tell uh, to our uh, viewers uh, what's the price per night of your boat. Oh, let's not start like that. Come on, I'm tell us. To, let it I'm out. I'm selling you a carpet here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, we do uh, about four thousand for a twelve day trip. Four thousand dollars for a twelve day. Four thousand euro or four thousand dollar. Or similar. Uh, we, we're we're fixed on the dollar. And How come? All right. So you're between three hundred and fifty and four hundred fifty dollars a night. Kind of I thing. would say we're a very affordable option yeah. in the upper range. Gotcha. You definitely, exactly, definitely. You're not the yeah. so the most compare, expensive. Yeah. Absolutely, you are not, and, and you're uh, not also the cheapest one. You're somewhere there in the middle. All we're right. a very good option. We have nitrox included. We have beers included. Uh, this beers. Is I wonder why right. you guys haven't been yeah, there. We yet, should yeah, we should be beer yeah, included. Yeah, yeah. Now you sold it. Now, now I'm there. <laughs> so, right. but we're a. Um, so that also means we don't have too many rooms. We have seven cabins. Okay. And uh, and what's the size of the boat for these seven cabins? 40, 40 meters, 40 nine meters. and a half meters wide. Seven cabins. We have a camera room. The kind of layout is a little bit more orientated towards imaging. All right. It's something like I like to bring into the boat. So, so you brought that in. And, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your uh, photography experience into, um, not in Rajampat, but like your background. Yeah, or like I would say I did my very first um uh open water uh, course oh. dive with a camera i bought a camera before i was a diver oh all right yeah, with, with film <laughs> <laughs> the um, little throwaway plastic one or one of those fancy cnc no no Mark it was 10s. not a throwaway it was a cnc but the, nice. the results were throwaway in the beginning not the camera <laughs> yes and, uh, uh, like my everybody. very first dive i did in a sauerkraut factory in germany because i was so excited to do my scuba course in holidays all right now sauerkraut Factory. Yes. How do you dive in a sauerkraut factory? So it's a closed down factory where they stored sauerkraut in big stainless tanks and they converted it into a dive center. And I think that's amazing to dive as You're a German. You're kidding me. first dive in a sauerkraut factory. And I liked it already a lot. And <laughs> this then is I very bought German. This camera. <laughs> yeah, that I was very German. Yeah, the Germans. Es ist wunderbar. I did my course uh, with this uh, film camera. Um, but then after that, I bought it digital compact camera that was I would in 2005 okay and in you started from very a, far man I bought a strobe and I uh, since 2007 I use um, DSLRs now you're talking yes. and what are you what camera are you using now I'm using a Canon uh, 7D Mark II well you mean you're not using a Sony I'm not sure we can have you on the podcast if <sighs> you're not using Sony I'm ah. not in the club anymore. Uh, no. See, what are you using other than Sony? Sony, <laughs> <laughs> the, the smaller Sony. Yeah. When we don't use okay. the big Sony. <laughs> well, I use Canon, and I'm quite happy with Canon. Yes. What are your lenses of choice uh, for um, that you like to shoot mostly underwater? I use, most of the time, I use the Tokina 1017 Fish Eye or the 100 Macro, but I have also a 60 Macro, a 35 Macro, and I have a kind of wide angle zoom all right macro does and now that you 70. are in uh, in raja ampat uh, most of the time what's what lens are you using most of the time the fish eye all if right. i do macro i do the hundred and for special occasions i use that 1770. when you say when you shoot macro in raja ampat what are some of the what are some of the the subjects that you actually look forward to shooting macro in, in raja um I mean, no-brainer, Pygmy Seahorses. Pygmy Seahorses, everybody likes Pygmy Seahorses. Plus, Raja Ampat has that uh, color variation of the Denise, which is also referred to as the... What? Santa Claus? Santa Claus, Pygmy Seahorse. Yes, sounds and, uh, such, a nice, such a cute name, yeah. the Santa Claus. <laughs> I've seen the Satomi Pygmy Seahorse in Raja Ampat for the very first time, and I've been... Bullshit! <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> the, what did you say? <laughs> did you see what? The I Satomi. have seen the Satomi Pygmy Seahorse. No way. What color was that? A whitish on a purple soft coral. All right. No, actually, we can believe you are a critter expert. Really, so. like the actual normal fancy purple soft coral that like like those soft corals behind you, the de 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 whatever they're called. Yeah. The one soft that corals. <laughs> yeah, those not, ones. Not one of those. Ah, no, okay. Not the more the like. All right. uh, yeah, do, yeah, do you yeah, have just, a Do you have a picture to show us about that, Satomi? Oh, I do not have a picture because it was ah, guiding it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds so, fishy. Uh, fishtail. Fish so tail. I didn't see it. Fishtail. So, but there is many other Pygmy seahorses. So you see the, the Pontohi there, the Denise, yeah. the Bargibanti, all those things that make photographers happy that, that they come for Indonesia for. Because you have the big stuff, you have the small stuff. 
I like gobies. I like antheuses. Okay, I like Okay, what sort? What special gobies can you see that you like to see over there? I like in Raja Ampat most the zebra dartfish. It's a light green goby with pink stripes mm. that lives in the shallow in areas with lots of surge. Yes. I would say the with Daram lots of area. surge. Hang on a second. With hey, lots of you. With lots of surge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Lots of blennies there as well. Lots of the, the really cool little red freckled blennies and stuff up there in the rocks. Yeah. That's true. But yeah. I'm not a blenny. Not a blenny guy. No, I'm more right. a goby guy. Are you a froggy guy? guy? There are some I'm special frogfish frog in, yes, uh, in Rajampa yes, too. there's one that carries eggs. Have you seen that exactly. one in Algerie under the dock? No. Little no. greenish one. Which, which other ones have you seen with eggs then? None. Ah. Ah. I've seen actually, I have seen the psychedelic one. In Raja Ampat, you saw the psychedelic? No. Okay. Ah, okay, in, in Ambon. In yeah, Ambon. Okay. Yeah. We all did that. You remember? For you, you viewers that you are tuned in with us, uh, if you don't know about the psychedelic, you can find it on our Facebook page. <laughs> with, um, you've spent, as you said, you spent seven, seven eight years in, in Lembe working at resorts. Now you're on the liverboards. What is, what is the big difference for you? What, what, I mean, do you prefer one over the other or what, what's the big difference uh, between them? You mean now in diving, a lifestyle, yeah, in a lifestyle, yeah. diving wise, yeah. lifestyle wise, what? Uh, what's the, the lifestyle, difference? The lifestyle, the lifestyle doesn't, doesn't really count. About. Like yeah. if you work in diving in a little resort at the end of the world, or in a little boat that moves around, the difference is not that much. Um, but for me, diving wise, what I what I like a lot, and what I realize now that I missed in Lembe is the the thing that actually makes Indonesia. Because Indonesia is a place people come to for pygmy seahorses, they come to for manta rays, they come to for soft corals. Now you can say, oh, there's nicer soft corals in Fiji, there is better manta rays in Mexico, in the no. Pacific, or there Not is... Not to both. <laughs> but what is the unique thing in Indonesia, and that's absolutely unique, to have one dive where you see manta rays, sharks, turtles, all those things, schools of fish, soft corals, and pick me seahorse and ghost pipe fish and frog fish. It's a little bit of bummer when you have the wrong lens on, but it's a nice thing if the visibility goes bad, you can always do something else. Or if you're a person that gets bored very easily, Indonesia is the perfect place because you have everything. From big to yeah. small, yeah. everything is It's not a warehouse that has just one dive. item in 50 varieties. It's the candy store. Exactly. That's what I like. And then uh, you can do a first dive with yeah. your wide angle, and then you spot a yeah. few macro stuff, and you say, hey, let's do another exactly. dive again there, but this time and we switch to macro. This is the thing that I appreciate most now on the liverboard and that I feel most different mm -hmm. about and happy. I guess also because the liverboard, like, as you say, land-based, you're in one location, you're there all year round. The other nice thing with, with the liverboard is, okay, right now you're in Raja Ampat, Next, you guys are going to be going through um, the Band of Sea and, and Alor, and then you're going to end up in Komodo. Of those locations, do you have a particular favorite? For me, I like Alor a lot because Alor is for me like a, a little second home, a little bit of memory from Lembe because Alor has fantastic macro opportunities. It's like I saw last year for the first time in my life the leopard anemone shrimp that little black and white shrimp that lives on the colonial anemones. Yes. I saw more rhinopias that I've seen anywhere. I, I had a record of six rhinopias on one day last year in Alor. And uh, at the same time, Great you have macro. clear water, you and have clear. beautiful walls, you have muck dive, you have coral. I've seen my first uh, dugong. And, not, and to, Mola Mola's. not to forget, too, is like Alor is a great uh, place uh, cultural wise. Yes. Not only on the surface, but even underwater. Like you see the traditional way of fishing with these uh, bamboo cages, which That's makes true. it uh, quite an interesting uh, yes. uh, subject. And you have often, you know, maybe kids the or kids people down. with uh, classic uh, uh, wooden yeah. goggles, uh, traditional goggles on, and, and they make it a great subject yes. to shoot, too. And they're very friendly. They like to be in the pictures. And, and it's, it's not nearly as crowded as Komodo. No, definitely, that's a definitely. very special thing because so you do a trip there and you see maybe during your trip one or two or three other liverboards. Correct. Not underwater, you just see them You passing. just see you them. Ju you oh, just figure it out by yeah. radio, which is not possible in a place Correct. like Komodo. Are you guys uh, just passing by a lot like, uh, or are you going to run a uh, couple of uh, trips in there? No, we do several trips um, where we focus on Alor, and we don't do them leaving from Alor itself, from Kalabahi, mainly for the reason that it's a pain in the 
mm. to right. get to because you need to go via Kupang to fly to. You have to do several flights in Indonesia. That's why we leave from Momer. Yes. And do the whole east of Flores until Alor and come back. And come back. Which is not a loss because you can do one side on the north, one side on the south. Oh, you're doing the south side. Okay. Oh, okay. If, if, the weather, big, if, if the weather is... The point uh, for Alor is that you have two oceans meeting. Right. Yes. A little bit like in Komodo. Oh, that, that's that's very really interesting because I've been mostly doing just the north part uh, even if i was on a back-to-back -back, uh, trip to alone yeah, i've I only done the south Momere to Momere. No, the south part has some very nice dives. i mean you have Beang Abang, the the muck dive of bay course. which everybody yes. knows right. but in the channels down there there's some very nice dive sites with stunning corals uh, sharks okay I, yeah. I th cool things well, okay if you have a spot maybe we're gonna jump on uh, <laughs> on that trip you know <laughs> I was like, just thinking uh, that you're myself. quite small we fit yeah. you in somewhere yeah, yeah. Fit you, yeah. <laughs> you I'm very compact but I bring lots <laughs> he's of he's really gears. good at uh, washing dishes <laughs> <laughs> and then on the way we have some very nice spots with, with soft corals sharks eagle rays so it's a very balanced trip I find because you have the bigger things you have the smaller things you have beautiful reef you have pure muck you have two different oceans that meet you have unique animals lots of dolphins travel through you have the chance to see a whale in autumn i mean not underwater yes. but i've seen a whale in autumn in alor yeah. like mola mola and cruise well. along and mola I've mola seen too a sperm whale last year and really? and uh, have you ever seen a super pod of dolphins like they can get in the hundreds number there yeah, yeah. in the strait even more yeah yeah exactly have you seen that? Yes. Like, I, I want really to see that. I've been there. I've seen the whale. I've seen the mola mola, but I haven't seen the super pod. Yeah, the super pod I only saw once, and that was actually at Nusselau near Ambon. Yeah. Wow. Just went on for like an hour. Yeah. Nothing but dolphins. Fantastic. Fantastic. Amazing. So do you see the super pods of dolphins mostly in the October period, or you can also see them uh, during this time of the year when you start to come back from Raja around April? I think the dolphins are not as much migratory animals than the whales. Mm -hmm. The okay. whales are something that uniquely come through in the late autumn, so mm -hmm. September, October, but mainly October, November. That's where sperms, blues, stuff comes through. Uh, but dolphins we see pretty much their year through. I, I wouldn't put my finger on when there was the bigger... Mm. Are you guys going to do... Are you going to concentrate a little bit more on Alor, like as in quite a few more Mary to more Mary trips um, and kind of skip some of the Komodo while it's busy season in Komodo? That's pretty much what we are doing because we're trying to avoid the, the, the super busy August yeah, season like in August Komodo. Season. And we're really enjoying the fact that you don't have too many other boats. Plus, we've done that now so many times, the Allure area, that we have quite a big variety of spots. So depending on the weather, we can always make alternative routes and offer a very balanced program in between big stuff, small stuff, there is land-based options to see the traditional village. Right. We can do snorkeling with the dugong. We can that's do... Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. You've, uh, I, I guess you've got some of these photos of the dugong that we can have a look at as well. Yes. 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 So bring your snorkel too. Bring your snorkel and maybe uh, a little prophylactic action. Uh, here it's, uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a little bit of an excited yeah. dugong sometimes. It's a horny dugong, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a a yeah. Oh, yeah, you look it's a pretty interested <laughs> into it. Yeah. Hey, tell us something about the equipment wise, not photography equipment. Like, what sort of wetsuit sh should we bring for the Allor trip? Um, that's a very uh, good question because, like, the advantage that I said, Allor, you have two oceans meeting, different stuff. It, it also comes down to the temperature where you have a warm water in the north and a rather cold water in the south. So you can have differences from about three. If you're lucky to six, seven, eight degrees Celsius when you're unlucky, mm -hmm. and uh, that requires different. So yeah. that's so mean we can go from the 28 uh, to the yeah, 20 degrees. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Let's say in Raja Ampat, I dive with shorts and a lava core yes. the whole year round. Yeah. Uh, whereas in the Alor, I'm ready to switch my top to a neoprene five mil top with hood. Yes. And if it gets really bad, I have uh, the pants. I have a two piece suit, yeah. which is a, like a. That's a great, that's a yeah. great combo. I like the two pieces. And piece uh, I think that's the coolest way to go if you dive along that chain of islands. I think the same thing goes for Komodo because you don't have to carry a, a shorts and a three mil suit and a five mil suit. And yeah. if you have a two piece five mil, you you you. It's the might. revival for, of for the Komodo. Two I go I go five mil and seven mil. Or the, the short time. stuff, five mil to seven mil. So make sure you bring your extra neoprene yeah. on the Alorp trip. So in Lembe. 
I used to dive with a 7 mil wetsuit all year round and I found it to be just right because you, I had that philosophy, you're never too warm. And on the boat, I changed to always wear as little as possible because then when it gets colder and you add something, it, it balances it off. And I also find not to be that cold diving on coral reefs where you swim against the coral uh, the current. Against the coral, <laughs> we don't do that, sir. We don't do that. No, <laughs> right. swim against the current. The uh, current. You're a little bit more excited because you're diving with sharks and mantas and turtles. You need to move a quite fair bit, and um, I think the best thing is to have a versatile uh, collection it. of underwater garment that you. So the the best thing is to is to bring your extra ne- layer of neoprene yes. to wear in the, yeah, when it gets cooler. But I think the way to cooler. go is to have. Uh, a, a type of suit be it a, a one piece or a two piece and then an extra bit to layer underneath that you can just wear by itself like, That's like an ogre layers yes <laughs> layers. <laughs> made by layers yeah that's a good one yeah, i didn't know you watch yeah shrek. i didn't know you watch shrek mike oh, come on i was watching it the other day on the plane yeah. that makes you so a little bit untough yes so let's stop talking about wetsuit okay before we come to the All right topic. let's talk about more like pictures and what you yeah let's talk about it photography a little bit here photography. it's quite possible that you being what seven years in in lembe or whatever it was with a camera pretty much every day it is probably possible that you've got more photos from uh, underwater photos in lembe than than pretty much anyone um would you say that's probably the you're case in the top, yeah in the top five underwater photographers in lembe for sheer amount sheer number of of dives with a camera Yes, I'm the quantity guy. Yes, you're the <laughs> and, and, the, and the quality guy as well. Uh, so what you've done is you've brought us a selection of your images here. Yeah. Um, just gonna we'll we'll pop these up on the screen as well and have a look at it. But uh, I've got what I think might be a lembe shot here. If you can just kind of walk us through on some of your techniques and and what some of your favorite images are. The first one that that grabbed my attention is this one here, which yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more about that one. Yeah, that's a perfect one to tell the story about macro photography because that's a Bangai cardinal fish. So that's something that is quite unique to Lembe, except for the Bangai Islands, which is in the Togian area where it originally comes from. But that's a fish that you can find in sheer numbers in Lembe Strait. And I think the key to good photography is to pick a subject that is common in an area but not common elsewhere, which is quite good to do in Lembe. That's why it's so famous. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the second key to take a good photography is to learn the behavior of the fish. So to see when it does what, in what pattern it moves, and uh, to not just chase the fish, but like uh, set up your shot. So All you right. need to know, okay, I want to have this fish like you can see it now on the photo. So you get in a good position, which means you look how the fish moves. Okay, it always comes back in this direction every now and then. It always has to do a little bit to do with the current yeah so if you have a very slight water movement you know okay the fish so does that every now and then you, you can see you can see pattern right on the yes, water you when, when you start to when you settle it down exactly. and you're yeah. patient and you look at the fish you can see it basically is always doing the same yes. pretty much same thing right? and then you have to make the call like will it come to that position that i will get my shot yes or no if it's a no save your time do something else because sometimes Mm -hmm. you get spontaneous things happening don't waste your time on a dive where it's quite unlikely that it happens but if you see oh this one is he has those eggs now for example and he's moving quite often to that same spot then spend your time for this shot i spend about 50 minutes yeah that's what i wanted to ask you say one five or five zero five zero five zero so So full dive you go you go in position you have your settings you you're obviously on manual focus, like back button focus, because it doesn't do, do that for uh, 10 seconds. Right, yeah. It does it that for a split second. Split second. Split very and, fast. Uh, and then you have to be ready. And uh, that makes a good behavior shot in macro is so on not this, like uh, swimming over the On this day, you went right. uh, with the mission of shooting Bangai Cardinal Yes, fish, that, right? that was on the house reef of Nad Lembe, which is also a very good resort to go. All right. Nad, N-A-D dash Lembe dot com. Yeah, where I had, uh, I think, one of the best times of my life in macro photography and also in my diving career in general. And this was taken there on the house reef, and that's something you can do there quite well. You have to find your shot you want to take. You have to go out on a mission and then and be strong. Th- and then this one, be... one thing for this photo that I want to say, please, when you shoot cardinal fish with eggs, 
Uh, I know it's a very tempting thing to do that after the afternoon dive in the evening and then go in for a little more extension. Don't do that when it gets dark because those cardinal fish, they spit out their eggs when you put light long on them when it's dark. Oh, interesting. Okay. Didn't know we that. didn't know that. Didn't okay, know that. so do not shoot cardinal fish in the late afternoon or early morning. They don't like your flesh. Well, that's still okay, but like, don't go too far in don't the dark. Don't go at nighttime, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And this is this is the kind of thing, this, this is where, you know, a guy like yourself spending so much quality time in a place like that, you're going to get outstanding images like this because you have the opportunity to say, all right, I know that these guys have their eggs in their mouths at this time of the moon. If you don't get it the last moon, then you'll get it on the next moon. And, and, and so that's what really makes your images stand out is because you've been able to see this behavior by spending so much time in that area uh, that you've been able to really capture a lot of behavior images, which you can definitely see in the selection that you've given us. Let's have another, let's look at another one of your, uh, your macro shots. I'm assuming it is from, uh, from Lembe, but keeping on the egg theme, We've got a uh, what looks to me like a, a, a little uh, goby here. Triple fin. Oh, a triple fin, one or the other. Again, goby. with yeah. some eggs. Goby. Uh, yeah, um, that's again, y you know your subject. So you, you know those gobies, they guard their eggs. And if you see one of them that's, that sits on one spot that looks quite, that it could be eggs, then you go closer and you look and you go like, oh, yeah, it is eggs. And um, and that's pretty much where you're gonna set your focus, right? On so the I eggs. saw this happening, and then I waited for it to aerate its eggs because yeah. it does that uh, okay, every now so and then that it spits water right. on the eggs it to give them keeps oxygen. coming back to those so, eggs. So yeah, I took a very long series of photos, um, not in the in the sense of that I took many photos because you stress the animal if you take too many, but that I spent uh, a relative long Stayed amount there for of time, a long time. Um, to get it. So. First, you, you set your focus on the eggs, how you want to have them, and then you wait for the fish to come in from that side that you saw that it came several times, and then you just wait for that one shot where you get the mouth open. Very good. And is it something that you would specifically do? You're like, all right, it's coming up to the new moon, or, oh, it's coming up to the full moon. Uh, I know I want to get this particular subject. I want to get this banga cardinal fish with the eggs, or I want to go get a jawfish with eggs, something like that. Is that something that you consciously would yeah. always think about ahead of time, or like, let's were you the, more of an opportunistic? Oh, let's look, say that's the jawfish. Jolly. Let's take the jawfish. So the jawfish, uh, it's it's a moon cycle. Yeah. So the jawfish will be on a half moon, on a decreasing moon. That's when the the eggs hatch. Okay. So if you have your moon going down, so from full moon to How's the other one? No moon? Half moon. <laughs> From full, so, uh, so yeah. a waning so moon. The full moon decreasing to the half moon, that's yeah. the time when the eggs look good. Really full. When you have the eye spots gotcha. and everything already in it. And they will hatch early in the morning. Okay. Or yeah, so time. five o'clock in the morning kind of thing. Getting away from your macro now, that, like you say, you're, you're branching out a lot more um, in your places like Alor, Komodo, Rajampat, mm -hmm. things like that. You did mention earlier one of your favorite dives in Alor. You've spotted seven rhinopias or something like that on the reef. Most people, when they are photographing, when they say, okay, today we're going to have rhinopias on this dive, the first thing that most people will think about is, oh, I need to have my macro set up or something like that. Yeah. Whereas we're having a look at what you've got here, what you've been able to do with this rhinopias is you've obviously shot it on a wide angle setup. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to shoot wide angle on this dive and what kind of technique you use to get this and uh, what the equipment shot. too tell us also about okay, what gear yeah, were you I mean, using on that um, shot i think for any animal in a photo if you can show its environment a little bit it gets stronger unless the environment is really really crappy but with a rhinopias i think being reasonably sized i mean bigger than a hand yeah, for people that don't know, a uh, uh, rhinopias can probably get, you know, 20 centimeters long. Yeah, this one would be about the size of my hand, a little bit more, and um, not very running away. So it's a little bit like a frogfish. You can mm -hmm. get very, very close. So these are the three reasons to not take a macro lens. Whenever you cannot take a macro lens, don't take a macro lens, I think. Um, because you can show the environment, you get a little bit of blue. It complements here really well with the with the pink color of the rhinopias. Definitely, there is a great contrast and a good yeah. separation of colors. So, there, a beautiful blue and. And pink. what I used here is a a, a mini dome. Yes. So uh, a a dome port with a relatively small diameter. How many inch? Um, this is a ten mil dome. 
10 mil domes, yeah. 6 inch. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, 100 mil dome. Yeah, 100 mil. 10 no, centimeter. 4 inch. The, uh, four inch. the Zen dome, uh, which I don't have anymore because I broke it on the Bandersy because I had water drops drying on it. I just switched to the new Nauticam 140 millimeter dome, which is also a mini dome, but it's suited for full frame. Okay. Who knows? Maybe I've so upgraded. It, it, so it I'm had water droplets on it, you say, and then what happened to it? Just because of the water droplets or did something happen to it? No, no, they just dried in. Ah, Too okay. many water droplets gotcha, dried gotcha, in gotcha, and gotcha, maybe gotcha. there was the one or the other scratch. Also. I was hoping for some exciting story about you was drawing and yeah. then you hit a wave and it and went uh, overboard. I was there with my two space to try to brush it up you. and oh, wow. I made so a mess with it. I'm this with the 1017 and uh, the mini dome and uh, two Seachem uh, strobes with diffusers on and one of the keys to shoot very very close close focus wide angle is to have uh, diffusers and to practice a little bit with strobe position, P- position. where would you say your That's strobe key, position yeah. was on this on this photo uh, i would say on this photo actually now that i look at it it's a little bit off because it's a little bit dark in the front left bottom corner the right side that was a dark crack it would not light up but uh, that, that's all right because it actually keeps away from the subject yeah. gives a contrast so um the key is to for me when i do very close wide angle uh photography i have two ways of doing it it's either bring the strobe very very close to the dome port so have them like you have them always when you do a fish eye like pretty much behind your handles and then the closer i go to the subject the more i move my strobes inwards until they are pretty much where my fingers are all right, so you're the basically it, sitting on top of the yeah, on the handles. Yeah, and maybe slightly over. Yeah, yeah. So and if I go and one extreme, kind of I also put my strobes behind and I point them behind my ears. Ah, okay. So yeah. I have them completely inwards so that the light goes. That's just normally right. the way the I do. Port, yeah. Which is the way I use it when, especially when the visibility is not good. Yes. So because you're you literally know. you've got your strobes right up close to the camera, but instead of facing forward towards the subject, they're facing back towards you inward yes so the strobes are behind my handles plus they're facing straight to my ears yes. right catching right. with the edge of the light like this yeah gotcha all right we can <laughs> we, we we can see that excellent shot definitely gets easier when uh, the water is nice and clear as a, a place yeah, like this do I you find s- often yeah. this sort of uh, visibility in allure so yeah this is now um just that sweet spot in that island Pura in the middle on the northern side. So you have still the warmer water that is tendentially a little bit mm-hmm. cleaner, but you already have that look and feel of the, the south a tropical, little bit. Yeah. The tropical Great. blue water, though, as well. Great shot. Great shot. All right. Well, Serge, um, with, your, with your different photography techniques, what we're going to do, uh, we'll show here on the screen, we're going to show a, a little slideshow of your pictures. Um, a little bit more we'll, we'll, we'll also plug do you have your own website yes okay we'll plug that on there as well <laughs> there we go um and we we'd, we'd like to thank you sirs for coming out you are actually you are our first our very first guest guest on the underwater tribe podcast how do you feel about that i feel very good about that and i say to everybody else coming here the coffee is really good yes what about the beer I way. hope it will be good. I'm yes. waiting still. It was a bit early. We need to shift the time of recording a little bit later, and then we bring the whiskey in. That's we also, good. yeah, exactly. We need to we need to find a whiskey sponsor. If anyone is out there who produces whiskey and you'd like to be featured here on the, the podcast, single let malt. us know. Let Especially us know. single malt. doesn't matter where it's from, but let us know. We like to try them all. Well, Serge, thanks a lot to being here with us today. It's been great talking with you, and uh, you, great, uh, you gave us some really... Uh, great advice and insight about Indonesia and diving in Indonesia on a liveaboard and not only. Thanks a lot, man. Cool. See you guys next time. In Rajapa. <laughs> in Alor. Well, thank you very much, Serge, for appearing on our podcast today. If you'd like to see more of Serge's work, we're going to feature a nice slideshow here at the end as we're, as we're fading out. But we're also going to feature it on our social media. So we're going to put it on our blog, on our website, underwatertribe.com. We're also going to feature a slideshow and gallery of his work on our Facebook page. So if you haven't followed our Facebook page, click on it today and and follow our Facebook page. And of course, we're going to be coming up with more YouTube stuff soon as well. So if you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, we'll see you again here next week.
wasn't brave enough yet just to talk to you Not a smooth talker, under pressure Sweaty palms ain't making it much better Something about you feels so special Yeah. 